So good afternoon. Um, Brian asked me to speak at this a while back, and uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about what to talk about, uh, and decided uh, to do a reflection on information uh, and architecture, which when I was the age of some of you in the room were two separate things. Uh, and, uh, but I, I can say I'm as old as cybernetics. I was born when cybernetics was published by Norbert Mar Wiener. So um, that's how long I've been around and in the trade, so to speak. Uh, so I want to talk about two things. Uh, in fact, those two things. Uh, how many are familiar with the cat in the hat? OK, oh, dear. We have some literacy problems in the room. Uh, <laughs> OK, so if you're not familiar with it, I urge you to become familiar with it. Um, two things that happen in the course of that story uh, basically ransack, create mayhem uh, within a home uh, where the mother's not present temporarily. Uh, and then everything unfolds from there. Uh, I'm going to keep those two things in mind. Uh, but in particular, the two things I wish to speak about uh, most urgently are, are poverty and polarity. Um, so Richard Saul Werman, who coined the term information architecture, did not consider it a metaphor. Uh, he was actually trained as an architect. But he was at the same time an information ecologist. He saw the possibility that information raw and untreated was a danger, capable of increasing misunderstanding, creating confusion, amplifying suffering, in fact, uh, and could swell to create unintended consequences of chaos and unnatural human disasters. He's devoted his life to addressing those concerns, uh, and he sought to bring principles of good form to the world of information. He realized that without good form, the utility of information would be lost, uh, and the futility of understanding would rule the day. Well, that day has arrived. A disaster of great magnitude is threatening civility and society. Uh, the day where the harm we represent to each other uh, exceeds our capacity to do good, to quote Stanley Cavell. Just as the middle class has been shown to rise globally and the UN millennial goals for eradicating poverty are beginning to get traction, our global information architecture is producing systemic failure and is collapsing due to internal flaws and external pressure. I use my, um, my daughter's definition for poverty. She uh, has worked at in the midst of poverty in the Arctic Circle and in equatorial Africa. I think she's pretty well versed in it. She says, poverty is not only a lack of resources, it stems from systemic and structural violence, which disproportionately affects the most vulnerable. Any effort to end poverty must look at all the forces at play. We know more than we understand. Yet, to quote my daughter again, most of what we know is not true. So the divide between what we know and believe and what we say and can prove exacerbates the disparity between people. It hollows out the discourse by offering binary choices and encourages reactive rather than creative engagement. It eliminates governance, consideration of rights, human rights, thoughtful examination of the nature of nature in favor of ballots that, are, ballots that are marked right and wrong. What we might examine more closely is the global information ecology and how our information system architecture are distorting our understanding of what is and what is important. We might, as information architects, expand the scope and depth of our reconnaissance before proceeding from what we already know and believe. We might consider what Gregory Bateson has identified as the necessary unity of mind and nature. 
he asks, what are the patterns that connect living systems? What are the inter interdependencies of culture, society, and political economy with nature and living systems? How are systems admittedly flawed, merging with each other to morph into supranational systems, as uh, James Greer Miller would call them, without governance by their authors or even civil authorities? Are we still focused on managing closed data and information systems rather than learning to govern open living systems? Are we even obtaining feedback from credible or useful sources? There is a contradiction, a conflict, or a violent conflagration occurring between the needs of living systems and the desires of one species depending on your point of view. If we think the cat in the hat will go out and get a magical machine and clean up the mess in the house before Mother Earth returns or notices, uh, we are deceived. We've been using bad information to form our beliefs. If we think we are building that magical machine with our existing architecture, we are not aware of or focused on the environments within which our information architecture operates. Our boundary conditions are too narrow and our horizon too immediate and our vision is too short-sighted. Someone said, people do not need information, they need relationships and use information to get the relationships they need. That was me, I was having lunch with Richard Worman years ago. Uh, he was stunned at first, but then it ended up in his book. So uh, I think he bought into it to some extent. But, uh, but we need to understand kinship in that sense, the relationships that we need. Study the relationships between people and between things and between people and things, the space between one and zero. Space where fuzzy logic lives, by the way. Consideration space, degrees of membership as opposed to binary choices of us and them. Between information haves and have-nots, where maybe and consideration space exist. How do we understand the interdependencies of systems? We need to identify link type. A number of years ago, Tim Berners-Lee was puzzled. Oh, he's famous for inventing the World Wide Web, if you're not aware of that. But, uh, uh, he was puzzled by the lack of interest in link type in the code for web pages. Didn't see anyone paying any attention to it or using it. So what is the link type of a sustainable information ecology? I believe the link type is kindness based in an understanding of kind or kinship. And I'm happy to say that our smart and kind graduate students in our MFA program in information design and visualization at Northeastern University are tackling major problems of information poverty. For example, ensuring civil rights and ending segregation, curing broken transportation systems, amplifying signals and signs of distress in the world, accelerating the implementation of gender equality, Identifying causes of lethal diseases more quickly. Redefining nationhood, migration, immigration, and borders. Producing timely evidence of natural disasters. Finding a better fit between your life and the market fables that fool people. Mediating confusion and conflict over scarce resources. Recalibrating our sense of time, time scale, and urgency. Revealing the origins and nature of our food supply. Restoring and sharing traces of actual cultural history. Questioning the role of rhetoric in providing data as evidence. And conveying uncertainty properly to combat dogma and polarity. They seek to enrich the information ecology and eliminate polarity. And the tools they invent promise to reform the practice of information architecture and potentially relieve 
information poverty. Since logistics and infrastructure are by nature violent, or at least violations of the ecology of inherent, adjacent, and even remote systems, how do we reconcile these competing forces? I suggest we use reconnaissance before we begin our research. Entering new territory requires that kind of alertness to what we know, what we don't know, and what we don't know we don't know, to quote a famous Secretary of Defense. Uh, search before research, to build some kind of covenant rather than a contract with our intended beneficiaries. So I suggest a new kind of framing, kind of a triadic framing of the ecology of all living systems and their relationships with each other, logistics, which are in opposition to that, and tend to favor the human species and have been aggressively applied during the Anthropocene, and the concept of kinship, which is the relationships between and amongst these forces at work in the world. This triadic framing of living systems for those who would propose to intervene or invade any information watershed. How can we close the protection gap that disadvantages the most vulnerable? How can we move from the fantasy of planning to the reality of preparedness and improvisation? How can we replace the lie in belief with the reality of the indexical information with proof and with evidence? How do we rescue the value of numbers from encoded fairy tales? How do we encourage thought, reason, consensus, and yes, questions? Attention is the currency of cultural capital, and distraction is a kind of theft a loss of value. Trust is the currency of social capital, and betrayal and despair breed violence. We celebrate data without comprehending its evidence. We jump from data to information and leave out transformation and interpretive steps. We leap from information to knowledge without understanding. And we assume wisdom is the same as common sense. We admire the smartest person in the room without consulting the kindest person in the room. So my questions are these. For us as information architects, however you might term that, what will be the new information architecture for an optimal information ecology? How, we, how will we understand one another through mediated presence? How will we appear to each other in cyberspace? What attention will we draw to ourselves in public <clears throat> in the future? How will we be able to trust what we see and read in public space? How will we reconcile our differing appearances in private space, cyberspace, and public space? And just what types of relationships do we need? I think of kindness as kinship and goodness. You must understand kind in order to be kind. We must understand link type to, be better, underst to better understand our relationship to others. <clears throat> and we must understand form to understand anything. So Richard Worman, the aforementioned godfather of information architecture, clearly stated his desire that understanding precede action. Will we follow that goal, that principle as information architects? Will we understand difference with greater sophistication? Will we integrate valuable differences through kindness? The 19th century people faced the choice between utility or beauty, and the decorative arts flourished. In the 20th century, we broke the code on physics and focused on material form and mechanical function we also broke the code on genetics and focused on understanding life forms. Mid-century, we were offered cybernetics to better understand living systems through feedback. In the late 20th century, we created the computational code for digital communication and cyberspace emerged as public space. By the turn of the century, we began to understand behavior and neuroscience better. 
and began to exploit the relationship of form and behavior at the network interface with interaction design. So well into the 21st century now, will big data profiling and machine deep learning reveal the links between symbolic form and systems of belief and behavior? Will those advances reveal our intentions toward each other before we know them? Can we turn our technological attention now to the interaction between and amongst humans? Can we discover the relationship between form and fruition inherent and entailed in human lives? I suggest that to do that, we master the cybernetics of metasystem design. We learn how integration and synchronization and parallelism operate in living systems. Difficult to do with a serial processor. Can we invent consideration space where maybe supplements the present polarity of yeses and nos with the binary options of ones and zeros and the tragic misunderstandings of us and them? Or will the grace period of the amber semaphore light disappear in the age of driverless cars? And we'll lose reference to that. Can we use information design to form signs that craft, evolve, and sustain such a new and necessary information architecture for a sustainable public information ecology? Can we learn how to conduct ourselves in cyberspace where so much is known and so little is understood? My sense is that we must better understand our cultural currency of attention and the social currency of trust, not as a means to more efficient transactions in the marketplace, but as coefficients of an aesthetic that informs a new civic etiquette. We must pay attention with interest to what we owe each other as humans, to our kinship, we must earn that trust needed to understand the value of difference and integrate our valuable differences. We can begin with our own information poverty by being what G. Spencer Brown, the author of Laws of Form, advocated, neither proud nor ashamed of our ignorance. Thank you. <laughs>